the Future Radio. And I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, March 3rd, 2019. And we are live tonight. We have a very exciting show planned for you tonight. It's been a lot going on. It's been a fantastic, uh, well, it's been a busy week. Fantastic uh, February for African American History Month. But it's been a very, very busy week. We saw the Michael Cohen hearings that took place uh, Tuesday through Thursday. Uh, this is causing, uh, I mean, we saw a number of articles written about this. I watched all of the hearings on Wednesday, uh, February 27th. They're about seven hours in length. I watched all of the, I watched the whole thing. And uh, you had Michael Cohen who implicated Donald Trump in at least 11 felonies. We saw Donald Trump speaking at CPAC on Saturday. He spoke for two hours and two minutes, and he just rambled and stambled and, and cursed. He is losing his mind. This is after coming up empty-handed when he went to Vietnam to meet with Kim Jong-un, uh, and uh, nothing happened out of that when he walked away. He had to walk away from the deal. Uh, the great negotiator couldn't negotiate a deal. Imagine that. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of this uh, that took place. And uh, what happened with Michael Cohen is extremely important because more investigations are going to be launched uh, because of this. Okay, uh, we saw uh, Representative Jerry Nadler on uh, MSNBC this morning. Um, uh, he was on, uh, let me see, it was, he was on this week on ABC with George Stephanopoulos. And um, we saw that. Uh, Representative Nadler, who chairs the House Judiciary Committee, and keep in mind it's the House Judiciary Committee, that is the committee where uh, that debates on impeaching the president. They vote on it first, then it goes to the general body of the House of Representatives. And House J Judiciary Committee uh, Chairman Jerry Nadler said uh, this Sunday morning, uh, March 3rd, 2019, that his committee will request documents for more than 60 people connected to Donald Trump and his administration, quote, to begin investigations to present the case to the American people about obstruction of justice, corruption, and abuse of power. This all came out of these hearings. Now, investigations have been going on. The Mueller investigation is, is rumored it's going to wrap up maybe this month and the report will come out. But Democrats are, because people went to go vote in midterm elections. Watch how this worked. Because people went to go vote in midterm elections in November 2018, Democrats won control of the House of Representatives, which means they control all of the committees in the House of Representatives. They have subpoena power. They can launch investigations, etc. So if Democrats had not won in, 2000, in, in November 2018, if people did not go out and vote, because they realize Trump is a fraud and a con man. They realize that Republicans have been aiding and abetting. They are accomplices with Trump, largely. If, if people did not go out and vote, including African Americans, to take back control of the House of Representatives, you would not have th those hearings that took place this week, especially the one on Wednesday. Okay? So we're going to talk some about that. And then we also saw that uh, Representative Mark Meadows, a Republican from uh, North Carolina uh, used an African American woman as a prop to prove that Donald Trump is not a bigot, is not a, right, uh, a white supremacist, even though Trump is a white supremacist. And Mark Meadows is a white supremacist also. An African American woman that he chose, Lynn Patton, she has a history of being ignorant and being an accomplice for the Trump administration, right? She, she's too ignorant to even know when she's being used. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Then we saw the Black Panther. One big at the Oscars last Sunday. It was taking place while we were on the air, but we didn't have a chance to talk about it. We saw Black Panther one big at the Oscars uh, this past Sunday, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, you know, we talked about the Stephen Clark um, killing, police killing that took place in Sacramento last year, right? Well, the um, district attorney came back uh, yesterday District Attorney uh, stated that there would uh, there will be no charges filed against the two police officers who shot and killed Stephon Clark. Remember, he was uh, uh, running home to his he was running to his grandmother's house. He was shot and killed in her backyard uh, uh, in 2018. The police said they thought he had a a gun, 
All he had was a cell phone and a cell phone case. So we'll talk some about that case as well as uh, both of these stories came down uh, pretty much on the same day, right around the same time. Um, also in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the case of Terrence Crutcher. Remember Terrence Crutcher shot and killed in cold blood by uh, a white female police officer, Betty Shelby. Betty Shelby um, was uh, found not guilty when it came to uh, killing uh, Terrence Crutcher, police officer. Well, now uh, we find out from the Department of Justice that Betty Shelby would not face civil rights charges. Okay, so this uh, this afternoon on Politics Nation with Reverend Al Sharpton, Reverend Al Sharpton interviewed Benjamin Crump, Attorney Benjamin Crump, who represents the Stephon Clark family. He also interviewed um, uh, Demario Solomon, Attorney Demario Solomon who represents the Terrence Crutcher family, okay? We're going to share that with you. That's, that's, that's extremely, extremely important. New York Times has two articles dealing with this. We posted these articles on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, over the past couple of days. So uh, go check those articles out uh, also, okay? That's extremely, extremely important. And remember that uh, the district attorney is an elected position. District attorney is an elected position. So it sounds like this district attorney in Sacramento needs to be voted out of office. Just like African Americans organized and voted Bob McCullough out of office, St. Louis uh, prosecutor who uh, did not prosecute the officer who um, shot and killed Mike Brown and Wesley Bell, African American, who, who was a judge, he was elected by the people to replace Bob McCullough. We saw uh, Cook County State's Attorney Anita Alvarez who took 400 days to bring charges against Officer Jason Van Dyke in the killing of Laquan McDonald, even though it was all captured on video. Uh, African Americans organized in the community, and they ran uh, Kem Fox, and they beat uh, Cook County State's Attorney Anita Alvarez, Cook uh, uh, Kem Fox, an African American female attorney. Uh, so we, we see this taking place in different cities across the country where people are realizing that the... Uh, the district attorney position is an elected position. And when they stay home and don't vote and just call in the radio shows and complain, that doesn't get anything done. Okay? So it looks like in Sacramento, they're going to have to do the same thing as well in Sacramento also. Organize and run somebody and run this uh, and replace this uh, uh, district attorney. Uh, we saw in, uh, in the Sanford, Florida area where... Uh, Trayvon Martin was killed, and we know just a few days ago uh, we celebrated the um, birth date of Trayvon Martin. Um, you had the uh, the district attorney, I forgot, it was the, I think it was the district attorney there, who did not want to bring charges, uh, Coring, I think Coring was her last name, and she was replaced by another district attorney. The people in the community organized and uh, voted her out of office. Okay, so we see this taking place across the country where people are realizing that the district attorney's office, this is an elected position, that taxpayer dollars pay for the district attorney, whether they agree with them or not. Okay, so people are starting to organize. All right, so we'll talk about that, those two cases as well, Terrence Crutcher and uh, Stefan Clark. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about Colin Kaepernick here on the show. And there were two stories dealing with Colin Kaepernick and African American History Month, Black History Month. So we have one disturbing story out of Florida. Uh, Blavity.com had an article about this, about an African American teacher who put together a Colin Kaepernick display for African American History Month. And apparently there were some white people at the school uh, or what have you, who took offense to the Colin Kaepernick display, and she was forced to take it down. We'll talk about that story. Then in Massachusetts, we saw something similar, but the students were allowed to put the Colin, Colin Kaepernick display back up, okay? And the question I have to ask people is, what are you so afraid of? Why is there such a fear of Colin Kaepernick? Why is there such a hatred and disdain for Colin Kaepernick, who, who took a knee uh, to op to uh, protest against the oppression of African Americans and people of color, 
as well as to protest against white supremacy and racism and police brutality. So what are you so afraid of? Or unless you unless you agree with white supremacy, the oppression of African Americans, people of color, and police brutality. Then, then if you so so it could, because if you want Colin Kaepernick to be quiet, and if you want if you don't want them to put up displays of Colin Kaepernick for African American History Month, then tacitly subconsciously you're saying you agree with white supremacy and racism and the oppression of African Americans and police brutality. And if you're not saying that, then show me in your actions how you're fighting against those things. Then, because what happens is is that you have a lot of people who just want African Americans to suffer in silence. And they don't want to be reminded about the oppression, about racism. So they want to attack those who speak up about it. But at the same time, they don't want to do anything to correct it. So this is what we saw taking place in, in Florida and Massachusetts. We'll deal with those stories uh, also. All right, and then um, last week, we ran out of time. I did not get a chance to deal with the 2019 theme for African American History Month, Black History Month, which was Black Migrations, Black Migrations. Now, everywhere I spoke, I spoke, I did at least 15 presentations in the month of February. I spoke at a lot of African American churches. Um, I did four presentations at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, uh, 71 Oakman Avenue in Highland Park, Michigan. And everywhere I spoke, no one knew the 2019 theme for African American History Month. There's an annual theme that comes from the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. What's Asala? That's the organization that Dr. Carter G. Woodson co-founded September 9, 1915. Well, who's Dr. Carter G. Woodson? He's the man who created Black History Month, which started out as Negro History Week in 1926. So everywhere, everywhere I lectured, I asked people, what's this year's theme? For African American History Month, even people, even organizations that put on Black History Month celebrations and nobody knew the theme. There's a purpose. It's not just coming together to recycle the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every year. That's not what this is about. The, the theme ties into the purpose, which ties into what's going on today. It connects the history to what's going on today to make this monthly celebration relevant. So in the second hour, we'll deal with this year's theme, which is an annual theme. It's not just for 28 days. It's for us to deal with this throughout the year. Black migrations, okay? And especially focusing on the great migration of the 20th century, basically 1915 to 1917. 1915 to 1970. All right, so we'll deal with that and more tonight on the African History Network show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong, wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also, go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can sign up for the email newsletter there as well. All right. Okay, so uh, we're coming up on a break here in a couple of minutes. Also, this past week, we lost one of the greats, uh, Nathaniel Taylor, better known as Rallo from Sanford and Son, passed away at age 80. We'll talk a little bit about that. I, I posted a number of articles uh, dealing with uh, that as well. Okay. All right, so uh, Michael Cohen testified this uh, past week. There were, on Wednesday, uh, February 27th, it was uh, seen by the public. And then on Tuesday and on Thursday, it was behind closed doors, okay? He was testifying in front of different House committees. Um, uh, Wednesday was the House Oversight Committee. It was riveting testimony from uh, the former personal attorney of Donald Trump, who worked for Trump for 10 years. 
And uh, he really, really, he dropped names. Uh, he provided corroborating evidence. He provided a, a check for $35,000. That was part of the repayment for him paying $130,000 to keep Stormy Daniels silent. Uh, New York Times, Washington Post has articles dealing with this. Michael Cohen accuses Trump of expansive pattern of lies and criminality. Lies and criminality. Donald Trump's longtime attorney and fixer accused him on Wednesday of an expansive pattern of lies and criminality, offering a damning portrayal of life inside the president's orbit, where he said advisors sacrificed integrity for proximity to power. Advisors sacrificed integrity for proximity to power. Michael D. Cohen, who was disbarred on Wednesday, February 27th, okay, because he was convicted of lying to Congress. He, re uh, uh, Michael Cohen represented Trump for a decade, laid out for Congress for the first time a series of deceptions by Donald John Trump, the sitting president of the United States of America, or as I call him, the first Russian president of the United States of America. He charged that Donald Trump lied to the public about business interests in Russia, lied to reporters about stolen Democratic emails, and told Mr. Cohen to lie about hush payments to cover up sexual misconduct. Now remember, we got to Michael Cohen because of Stormy Daniels. That's how we got to Cohen. The, the, the Stormy Daniels story broke about hush payments uh, to her to keep her quiet about an alleged affair with Donald John Trump. That's how we got to uh, Michael Cohen. All right. Now, who broke the story of Stormy Daniels right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation? That was me on Cliff Russell's show. When Cliff Russell was still alive, I was a guest on his show and we were talking. And during the break, you know, I had my laptop with me during the break. I'm checking news stories. This news story pops up on Facebook from rawstory.com. I said, Cliff, look at this, right? So when I first heard about this story and about hush payments, I said, this sounds like a campaign finance law violation. I was correct. People said, oh, this is just about sex. I said, no, this sounds like a campaign finance law violation. That's a felony. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hi, I'm Joan. All right, stand by, guys. We're back in two minutes. How's everybody doing? 313-778-7600 is the call-in number. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number. If you have a question or comment. Strong start. Oh, yeah, thanks. 313-778-7600 is the calling number. So we'll go to that uh, clip from New York Times uh, for Michael Cohen. Yeah, I'll introduce it. Yeah, I'll introduce it. How's everybody doing? All right, share this broadcasting on Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. You can also donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show as well. We'll post that link as well, okay? We have order shipping out this week. It's been a very, very busy uh, February and busy African American History Month. They had me speaking all over the place. What's up? Yeah. All right, guys, stand by. Okay, who we have? We have Tanisha. Did anyone see the Trump biography on a and &E? I missed it on a and &E. I've seen other Trump biographies, things like that. I missed it on a and &E. Was it good, Tanisha? All right, stand by. <clears throat> okay. We're back from break in a minute. Okay. All right, we have Yvette. I'm watching the Trump dynasty now. This can't be made up. Oh, yeah, Trump has been a con man from day one. He's been a con man and a white supremacist. And in 1973, Donald Trump and his daddy was sued by Richard Nixon's Department of Justice for discriminating against African Americans and Hispanics in, uh, when it came to uh, renting apartments in Manhattan. So, so Donald Trump's been a white supremacist for a long time. Okay, so we'll post this right here. You donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. All 
All right. Who else we have here? Tanisha Outlandish, she said. Yeah, and see, and see, Trump is like the ultimate con. And what happened was a lot of white people fell for this. They voted for white supremacy and racism. Now they're being screwed. Bobby Sanchez. All right, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Five, four, three, two. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. And I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, March 3rd, 2019, and we are live. All right, so we have a lot to talk about. Uh, 313-778-7600. It's the call-in number, 313-778-7600. It's the call-in number. We have Juanita. We have Rob uh, watching uh, on the Facebook fan page, 910 AM, the Superstation Facebook fan page. Uh, also, Chris. And uh, also, we're broadcasting on um, our fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network on Facebook as well. Okay? All right, so right before the break, we were talking some about Michael Cohen's uh, um, testimony on Wednesday, okay, that was in an open hearing, and he testified in front of the uh, House Oversight Committee, okay, it was uh, very revealing, it was very damaging to uh, Donald Trump, Trump was implicated in at least 11 felonies, and you're going to see uh, new investigations uh, launched from this as well, and they are building a case against Trump. They're building a case for impeachment, um, and some other things, and also the Southern District of New York that investi that, that Trump Trump and his allies fear the investigations coming from the Southern District of New York more than Robert Mueller because Robert Mueller is more of a narrow, narrower scope. Southern District of New York they can go anywhere they want to. Okay, they don't have any restrictions uh, over them. All right, so New York Times has a good article. Michael Cohen accuses Trump of expansive pattern of lies and criminality. I want to go to this clip here that's in this article from the New York Times that gives you some background information. Let's go to this clip. Do anything to protect Mr. Trump. Turn up I am ashamed okay. because I know what Mr. Trump is. He is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat. President Trump's former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, has become a central figure in investigations related to the 2016 election. So how did this happen? Cohen began working for the Trump Organization in 2007. His job? To make problems go away. Part fixer, they say uh, Mr. Trump's pit bull, his uh, right-hand man, part lawyer. Two of those problems, Trump's alleged affairs with Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. Cohen says Trump directed him to arrange payments to keep them quiet. When it comes time for the financing, which will be what financing, we'll have to pay you. So, no, 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 I got no, no, no. This deal, among other things, caught the attention of special counsel Robert Mueller. And in April of 2018, the New York Times just reported that the FBI just raided today. the home and office of President Trump's Trump. longtime lawyer, Michael, Michael Cohen. Cohen. At the time, Trump stood by him. Good man, it's a total witch hunt. But things changed after Cohen agreed to cooperate with Mueller's investigators. Cohen will continue to cooperate because he's a weak person and not a very smart person. Both men say the other is lying. The man doesn't tell the truth. He's lying very simply to get a reduced sentence, okay? In 2018, Cohen faced multiple charges in two different cases. Federal prosecutors in New York charged him with campaign finance violations for the hush money payments. They also found evidence of tax evasion and that Cohen lied to a bank. Mueller's team then charged Cohen with lying to Congress about negotiations to build a Trump Tower in Moscow a project which involved President Trump and extended into the 2016 election. Cohen pleaded guilty on all counts. So what's next? Cohen was sentenced to just over three years in prison, which he'll start serving in May. He's continued to cooperate with prosecutors and testified before Congress. I have fixed things, but I am no longer your fixer, Mr. Trump. Mr. Cohen. Okay, so that is um, a clip from the New York Times. It's in the article, Michael Cohen accuses Trump of expansive pattern of lies and criminality. Now, the article goes on to say, 
uh, the accusations aired at a day-long hearing before the House Oversight and Reform Committee exposed a dark underside of Donald Trump's business and political worlds in the voice of one of the ultimate insiders. Now, Michael Cohen knows more about Trump's business dealings, how Trump operates, what Trump has done, than the Republican members of the House of Representatives who are aggressively trying to defend Donald Trump, even when it's obvious that he's lying. He knows more than Jim Jordan of Ohio, more than Republican Mark Meadows of North Carolina, more than Matt Gates of Florida, who tweeted really a threat to uh, Michael Cohen, okay, asking if his uh, 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 father and his uh, wife knew about his girlfriend, things like this, right? And so, uh, so now Matt Gates is uh, being investigated by the Florida Bar Association because Matt, Matt, Matt Gates is a is an attorney. He later apologized for it and deleted the tweet. Okay, so so these are see these are the type of these are the type of henchmen that Trump has working for him. And before Democrats took back control of the House of Representatives, Republicans largely were not doing their job in the House of Representatives, especially, and providing oversight. They're there to be a check on the president. They're not subjects of the president. They're not there to be the president's allies. They're there to be a check on the president based upon their Article I duties. And they, they have been woefully uh, 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 neg neglectful of their duties. OK, so uh, the accusations aired at a day long hearing about the House before the House Oversight and Reform Committee exposed a dark underside of Trump's business and political world in the voice of one of the ultimate insiders. Perhaps no one, clo no close associate has turned on a president in front of Congress in, in such dramatic fashion. And with such high stakes since John Dean testified against President Richard Nixon during the Watergate scandal. Okay, and John Dean was the White House counsel. Okay. Uh, Michael Cohen, Michael Cohen said, quote, he is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat, end quote. And uh, Michael Cohen, who has pleaded guilty to lying under oath to Congress, among other crimes, said he did so to protect Donald Trump. He said, quote, I am not protecting Mr. Trump anymore, end quote. Now, while the details have been different, his portrait of the president broadly resembles those provided by others who have split with Donald Trump, including former aides, business associates, and even his one-time ghostwriter. That's, um, um, th 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 this is the uh, Tony Schwartz. Tony Schwartz is Donald Trump's ghostwriter, Tony Schwartz is the man who actually wrote the book, The Art of the Deal. Donald Trump did not write The Art of the Deal. Tony Schwartz wrote that with Donald Trump, but Tony Schwartz was the ghostwriter. Okay? So Donald Trump likes to take credit for writing The Art of the Deal. He never mentions Tony Schwartz. Tony Schwartz has been interviewed a number of times on MSNBC, so you can Google his name. Tony Schwartz was the man who wrote The Art of the Deal. He was, he was the ghostwriter. Okay? That Trump doesn't want to give any credit to. Imagine that. So you have uh, business associates and even his one-time ghostwriter, ghost Tony Schwartz, who likewise have described a president who bullies, dissembles, and cheats to serve his own interests. Okay? Now, also, Michael Cohen testified that Donald Trump inflated the value of his assets and documents given to Deutsche Bank. Now, that's a felony. That's, that's fraud. That's a felony. Okay? And it, it has been asserted in the past that Donald Trump inflates his assets in one instance and then deflates them in another instance when it comes time to pay taxes or what have you. Okay? So Michael Cohen, who understands Donald Trump's business dealings better than most people, better than the people who call in the radio shows throughout the week defending Donald Trump, most of these people never met Trump, never spent an hour with him. Michael Cohen knows this inside and out. He's exposing all of this. But it remained unclear whether Michael Cohen's testimony would change the political dynamics of a series of scandals that have already polarized Washington and the country and that could lead to an impeachment battle this year. Now, Representative Elijah E. Cummings, Democrat from Maryland, and, uh, and the committee chair, he's the committee chair, so everybody saw him uh, on Wednesday. 
said afterward that Donald Trump may have committed a crime while in office, but Republicans were unmoved. Assailing Michael Cohen as a proven liar, they denounced the hearing as a charade and an embarrassment for our country orchestrated by partisan Democrats seeking a pretext to try to remove Donald Trump from office. No, they're just doing their job. Their job is oversight. Their job is to launch investigations. Their job is to be a check on the president. Once again, Republicans have not been doing their job largely for the past two years. Okay? Now, not only that, Representative Elijah Cummings, after the hearings, he was interviewed, and he said that they're going to have to go back through and read the transcript to find which or who to bring in to testify next, which investigations to launch. But he said basically the, the people who uh, Michael Cohen named, those are the people they're going to be going after next. Okay? So, you, I mean, this Michael Cohen really, really opened up a can of whoop ass. Seriously. And... Uh, this is why Donald Trump is so scared. So if you saw Donald Trump at CPAC on Saturday rambling for two hours and two minutes, this is why. Donald Trump is scared. He knows they're coming after him. But also, he knows the prosecutors from the Southern District of New York are coming after him also. And they're going to be even worse than the Mueller investigation and the hearings and in the congressional hearings. The, the Southern District of New York, those prosecutors are going to be even worse. Okay, so... Assailing uh, Michael Cohen as a proven liar, Republicans denounced the hearing as a charade and an, and an embarrassment for uh, our country, quote-unquote, orchestrated by partisan Democrats seeking a pretext to try to remove Trump from office. Democrats said Republicans, quote, ran away from the truth, end quote, and they sought to defend a corrupt president who has employed, quote-unquote, textbook mob tactics. Now, the hearing took place while the president was halfway around the world in Vietnam for another meeting with North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un. Nothing came from this meeting. Trump, Trump just wasted taxpayer dollars going over there. He ended up walking away from a deal. Nothing, it, it, nothing came away from it. He didn't gain anything from it. Just a waste of taxpayer dollars. Now, his family and advisors expressed anger at the timing, arguing that Democrats were undercutting Donald Trump during sensitive nuclear diplomacy for political gain. As with so many other moments of the Trump era, the hearing seemed to be as much about partisan theater as fact-finding. Democrats and Republicans set forth their conflicting narratives about the man who once served Donald Trump either as a duplicitous, disgruntled former employee or a fallen sinner trying to redeem himself by coming clean. Through it all, Michael Cohen, who's 52 years old with dark circles under his puffy eyes, already tired from eight hours of testimony behind closed doors the day before on Tuesday, <laughs> and waiting and awaiting a three-year prison term that begins this spring, as uh, May, I think May 16th, he goes to prison, apologizing repeatedly to his family. Michael Cohen portrayed himself as a broken man brought down by hubris, at one point choking up and wiping tears from his eyes at the mention of the effect on his daughter. Through some five hours of nationally televised testimony, Michael Cohen described his years working for Donald Trump as a trip into a world of deceit in which the now disbarred lawyer ignored his own conscience to get close to a magnetic, a, a magnetic person of power. Michael Cohen said, quote, sitting here today, it seems unbelievable that I was so mesmerized by Donald Trump that I was willing to do the things for him that I knew were absolutely wrong. OK, and uh, he said when he met Trump, he knew him as, quote, a real estate giant and an icon, end quote, at the center of the action. Quote, being around Mr. Trump was intoxicating, end quote, he said, you know, and, and Trump. He, you know, and this is what people say about pimps also. Pimps, you know, have a lot of charisma. You know, pimps are smooth. They're smooth talkers. You know, they get you to do things you normally wouldn't do. You know, this is like, this, this is like a pimp mentality also. People say the same thing about R. Kelly as well. Now, in private business, Mr. Coyne, Michael Coyne said he rationalized Donald Trump's dishonesty as trivial. But as president, he said, quote, I consider it significant and dangerous, end quote. Now, D 
Donald Trump's re-election campaign organization di dismissed Michael Cohen on Wednesday as a convicted perjurer who should not be trusted. They said, quote, this is the same Michael Cohen who has admitted that he lied to Congress previously. Kaylee uh, uh, McEnany, uh, McEnany uh, the campaign's national press secretary, said in a statement, she said, quote, why did they even bother to swear him in this time, end quote. Now, what I find interesting is they didn't ask the question, why did Donald Trump, who's told about 8,600 false and misleading statements since he took the oath of office January 20th, 2017. Why are all these people around Trump going to prison for lying? This is the same guy who said he was just going to hire all the best people. Why, why are all these people around Trump going to prison for lying? You've got uh, George Papadopoulos. You've got Paul Manafort. You've got Rick Gates. You've got... Uh, Michael Cohen, why are all these people going to prison for lying? See, these, these, so the, the question they should ask themselves is, who, who are these people that Trump has around him? And why? Then you look at the story from the New York Times, because this was a, this was a huge week. You look at the bombshell story for the New York Times from this past week, dealing with um, Jared Kushner. Trump ordered officials to give Jared Kushner a security clearance. There's no way in the hell Jared Kushner should have a security clearance of any type. Jared Kushner owes at least $285 million to Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank is now cooperating with the House Finance Committee. How do we know? Because this past week, when Representative Maxine Waters was interviewed, she talked about that. We're going to share that clip with you uh, shortly. Okay, this thing is heating up. You're gonna find out this is about money laundering. You're gonna you're gonna find out a whole bunch of stuff. And the way this is gonna end up is Trump is gonna be forced to resign from office. Just as Richard Nixon was forced to resign from office August 9th, 1974, after he was reelected. I don't think Trump is gonna be reelected because Hillary Clinton got 2.8 million more votes than Trump did. And people are starting to wake up. We see the we see the blue wave that happened with midterm elections. And people realize the importance of voting now, and you're gonna, it, it'll probably set a record for the number of people voting in the 2020 election. Okay, they're not gonna have this again. Trump is being exposed as a fraud. Don't worry about his base. His base only makes up about 27% of, of voters. Okay, registered voters. His base only makes about 27% of registered voters. So don't worry about that. You know, as I told people in 2016 election, you just make sure you get your black ass out there and vote. OK, you see, too many of us stayed home in 2016 and we're paying the consequences for that. Trump ordered officials to give Jack Kushner a security clearance. Donald Trump ordered his chief of staff at the time, John Kelly, not to be confused with Jim Kelly, Black Belt Jones. This is John Kelly. Right. To grant his son in law and senior advisor, Jared Kushner, a top security, a top secret security clearance in 2018 overruling concerns flagged by intelligence officials and the White House top lawyer, who was Don McGahn, White House counsel at the time, four people briefed on the, briefed on the matter said, Donald Trump, Trump's decision in May of 2018 so troubled senior administration officials that at least one, the White House chief of staff, John Kelly at the time, wrote a contemporaneous internal memo about how he had been ordered, quote unquote, ordered to give Jared Kushner the top secret clearance. The White House counsel at the time, Don McGahn II, also wrote an internal memo outlining the concerns that had been raised about Jared Kushner, who had to update his SF-86 form, okay, standard form 86, which is the form that you list like any types of, um, uh, meetings that you had with foreign uh, 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 foreign business people, things like this, any type of conflict. He had to update that about a hundred times. Okay, so all, all these red flags are there. And Trump overrules his own intelligence agencies who said, his own intelligence, his own intelligence officials, who said, don't get this guy top level security clearance. So 
the disclose. So let's continue here. The White House counsel at the time, Don McGahn II, also wrote an internal memo outlining the concerns that have been raised about Jared Kushner, including by the CIA, and how uh, Don McGahn had recommended that he not be given a top secret clearance. So you have Don McGahn saying he should not get a top secret clearance, White House counsel. You have John Kelly, the White House chief of staff, saying he should not get top secure, security clearance. You have CIA officials saying he should not get top security clearance. And what does Trump do? He just does the opposite and say, oh, he should get top, uh, 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 top secret security clearance. What's behind all this? Why? What's behind all of this? What is Jared Kushner doing with the top secret security clearance? So the disclosure of the memos contradicts statements made by the president who told the New York Times in January in an Oval Office interview that he had no role in his son-in-law receiving his clearance. Trump lied. So then you have people, and, 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 and uh, Ivanka lied also. So then you have people say, well, the president, he can give top secret security clearance to anybody he wants. That's true. But if that's the case, then why did he lie about it? That's true. Now, if that's the case, so why did Trump lie about it? We keep finding out that they keep lying, okay, even when it comes to something they can do. They keep lying about it. Why? So Jared Kushner's lawyer, Abby D. Lowell, or A-B-B-E, Ab, Abe D. Lowell, Lowell, also said that at the time the clearance was granted last year that his client went through a standard process. Ivanka Trump, the president's eldest daughter and Kushner's wife, said the same thing three weeks ago, but they lie. Asked on Thursday about the memos contradicting the president's account, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the, one of the biggest liars there is, just keeps going out and showing she has no integrity. She's the White House press secretary. She said, quote, we don't comment on security clearances, end quote. Really? I guess when you keep lying about it, you know, it becomes hard to... Uh, figure out which lie you told so it becomes hard to keep up with the lies. So you say, oh, we, we just don't comment on it. Okay. Check this out from the New York Times. This was a bombshell article from the New York Times. I don't have time to get through the rest of it. Trump ordered officials to give Jared Kushner a security clearance. He, he, Jared Kushner has no, he has no business getting a clearance to be a security guard at McDonald's with the type of debt that he owes. With the, with the number of times he had to update his SF-86 form. This is ridiculous. If, if, this was, if, this was, if this happened under President Barack Obama, they would have drawn up articles of impeachment months ago on him. There would already be a trial in the U.S. Senate. If this happened under President Barack Obama, oh, absolutely not. But under Donald Trump, the Republicans are covering up for him. They're aiding and abetting. Okay, this is why Democrats must take back control of the U.S. Senate in 2020. I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, but I sure as hell ain't stupid. I'm looking at what's going on. I've been, I've been studying this going back to 2015 when Trump first announced he was running. So, on February 27th, the day that you had, that was Wednesday, the day that you had the, uh, the open hearings that we saw uh, broadcasted, Katie Turr interviewed Ari Melber, who's the chief legal correspondent for MSNBC, okay? I want to go to this clip here. Let's go to clip two. Um, this is from February 27th. Extraordinary testimony from Michael Cohen, damning series of allegations against Trump. Let's go to this clip. It is not enough to attack Michael Cohen's uh, credibility or history of lying because this is all about material that other people are involved in. Uh, with evidence. So it is a, an elections crime, uh, but it's not a necessarily a high crime and misdemeanor, not necessarily the bar for impeachment. So here I agree with Ari, and here's what I think is now most problematic for the president with respect to the hush money payments. We now know that the crime of trying to suppress this kind of evidence, to hide it from the American people during the election, continued. So he successfully tamped it down. 
Then it continued through the inaugural period. It continued after he took office. And now we have Michael Cohen saying that that conspiracy, which is an ongoing offense, it's not like a robbery or an assault where it's one and done. We now have a conspiracy, an ongoing crime that, that moves right into the White House when the president is saying, as he's you know, showing off the paintings in the Oval Office to Michael Cohen, don't worry, the, the reimbursement for your hush money payments, it's coming. Now we have crime right in the White House. Carol, how significant is that? I mean, there is the DOJ memo that says you can't indict a sitting president. There's questions about whether that would hold in a court of law. But how significant is it for a man to implicate the president of the United States in committing a campaign finance crime while he was in the Oval Office? Well, it's certainly something that uh, is very unusual, right? I, I don't know that it's ever happened before. But on the other hand, you know, the contours of high crimes and misdemeanors uh, is, in the impeachment context, is very uncertain. And uh, the DOJ memo to date has held. And Bob Mueller has sent signals that he intends to uh, respect that. So uh, it may be up to Congress at the end of the day to decide whether they think that this falls within the impeachment realm or whether the Southern District of New York is going to put together enough of a case that they think they need to uh, go back to the Justice Department and say we need to revisit this policy. Jeremy, how do you think Michael Cohen's doing? I think he's coming off as very credible, very remorseful, very pained, and obviously shaken by the turn of events. I mean, this is an astounding account, Katie, the ultimate insider man account, the guy who was at the elbow of, of the head of the Trump organization, the presidential candidate, and then the president. And here he is essentially turning on his former boss and saying not only did he engage in substantial financial crimes, but he had a heads up from Roger Stone about the WikiLeaks email dump. He says he suspects that Don Jr. informed his father about the Russia t Trump Tower meeting in June 2016. And on and on, there are a litany of other uh, allegations, credible allegations, that Michael Cohen is levying against his former boss. And I think, of course, the Republicans are trying to rough him up. But at the end of the day, the documents, the, uh, the credibility of the witness, and the facts will be what drives how the Democrats want to take the investigation from here. It comes down to credibility, Ari, and we've been having the discussion about credibility all morning. Clearly, the Republicans are trying to undercut Michael Cohen's credibility, but again, he came with documentation, and the things that he doesn't have documentation for, i.e., was there Russia collusion, he said, I don't find, find out, I don't have evidence of direct collusion between the Trump campaign or Donald Trump and Russia. I have my suspicions, and let me tell you what those are and why I have those, but he admits that he does not have that direct Evidence. I think that's a great point, and he is one of the only people in America right now who's about to go to prison in part for lying to Congress. So he knows better than almost anyone alive why he should not lie today, which goes to the structural pressure and for his credibility. If I can make one broader point, yeah. because here on your show is the first time I've been back on air all day since we've been watching the hearings, just take a step back. Yeah. We just saw something totally extraordinary. And in these investigations that have been going on in Washington for Mueller and in New York with the SDNY, all the key insiders who flipped, none of them have spoken under oath in public. None of them. Not Paul Manafort, not Rick Gates, not Michael Flynn, not the other side characters. George Papadopoulos has been out and about, but never under oath. This is literally today the first time we've heard a Mueller witness under oath speak for an extended period of time, addressed by members in both parties, and what he lays out is a damning series of allegations against the sitting president, not all of them crimes, but many of them extraordinary is in their own right. Is this for his benefit, though, or is this at his peril? He's already pleaded guilty to lying to Congress. If he lies to Congress again, I imagine that would get him in a lot more hot, tr hot, hot water. Look, I often quote uh, rappers from Brooklyn. I will quote uh, the wisdom of the Italians, qui bono. Who benefits? I think you're asking the right question. Yeah. Does he stand to benefit? It is possible in the long run under the rules that he might later get some reward from other prosecutors. But everything about today's testimony requires 
his truth at great personal risk, which is why when he says these things, I think any fact finder who doesn't have skin in the game is going to find them interesting. The partisanship we saw on the committee was evident, and, and I think on both sides to some degree, who are looking for things. But again, to take a step back, this is a Mueller witness who Mueller said in court they found credible on the key points that he testified to, speaking in public and describing a president who basically ran on a lark, yeah. used his company for personal enrichment and to deal with dirty deeds struck unholy alliances with the Inquirer company to, to bury other stories, lied to the public, lied to other people, allegedly lied to his family. Now, they're allegations, but this is extraordinary. And if you want context, what if this had happened in the middle of the Bush administration or the Obama administration or the Harding administration? America would have a full meltdown. You so okay, pause it right there. Yeah. All right, so what you have here is allegedly Donald Trump running a criminal enterprise out of the White House. That's what you have here. When he's signing checks to pay back hush money to keep Stormy Daniels quiet, that's a campaign finance law violation. That's a felony. You literally have, it's alleged that Trump is running a criminal enterprise out of the White House. Now, if you look quickly, because we're coming up on a break, let's look at this article from vice.com. News.vice.com, V-I-C-E. Michael Cohen implicated Trump in at least 11 different felonies. This is from March 1st, 2019. You have to read this article. Number one, potential evidence in a Russia conspiracy case. Michael Cohen introduced new information linking Trump and his campaign to a possible criminal conspiracy relating to the hacked Democratic emails that were stolen by Russian spies and released by WikiLeaks before the 2016 election. Some legal experts believe that Mueller's investigation may result in a sweeping conspiracy charge that echoes the past presidential scandals of Watergate and Iran-Contra. Michael Cohen said Donald Trump was told in advance of the WikiLeaks dumps by Trump's longtime confidant, Roger Stone, and that Trump responded, quote, wouldn't that be great? Okay, so two, we have lying to Mueller. Michael Cohen's story about Trump's conversation with Roger Stone also contradicts what Donald Trump reportedly told Mueller in writing when, when Trump submitted his written answers to the questions that the Mueller investigation sent to him. Trump's legal team reportedly rejected Mueller's request for an interview with the president. I wonder why. Because they know Donald Trump is going to sit there and lie. That's why. And purging himself. And instead responded to the special counsel's questions in a letter. Trump told Mueller's team in written answers that Roger Stone did not tell him about WikiLeaks CNN reported citing two sources, quote-unquote, familiar with the matter. That stark contrast could concern Trump because lying to a federal investigator is a crime. Three, suborning perjury. Michael Cohen said Wednesday that Trump implicitly told him to lie to Congress under oath about attempts to develop a Trump Tower in Moscow in the midst of the 2016 presidential campaign, a move that could potentially constitute the crime of suborning perjury. Okay, uh, proving that proving that would be tricky, however, thanks to what Michael Cohen called Trump speaking in quote unquote code. All right. Number four, campaign finance violations, campaign finance violations. We're coming up on a, we up on a break. We're up against a break. OK, we're coming up on a break. We'll contain this on the other side of the break. Then we're going to get into uh, Representative Mark Meadows using Lynn Patton as a silent prop just like a black woman on the auction block to try to prove that Donald Trump was not quote-unquote racist. Rashida uh, Tlaib from Detroit, Representative Brenda Lawrence from Detroit uh, uh, commented on this as well. Reverend Al Sharpton talked about this. We have all that on the other side of the break, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation and Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotep, the African History Network show. We'll be back in a few minutes. Oh, you've decided. All right, stand by, guys. We're up against a mandatory break. How's everybody doing? 313-778-7600. So Michael Cohen implicated Trump in at least 11 felonies. All right? So this week, Monday, you're going to have this blowing up because they're going to be uh, a request for documents. Okay? Um, Representative Jerry Nadler, who chairs the House Judiciary Committee, is requesting documents from more than 60 people in the Trump probe. All right, this this thing is really, really starting to heat up. 
this thing's about to blow up. All right, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Now, what's interesting, right? You have a lot of Republicans who said the Michael Cohen hearing was a waste of time, waste of taxpayer dollars, right? Republicans held 33 hearings on Benghazi, okay? Dealing with Hillary Clinton and Benghazi. They held 33 hearings on Benghazi, but complained the Cohen's testimony was a waste of time. Uh, thinkprogress.org has a big article about this. We'll post the link here, all right? But Trump knows he's in deep trouble. So we have lying to Mueller, suburban perjury, campaign finance violations. We'll pick up on that. Okay, we're going to go to uh, clip three when I come back also, Rachel. We're going to go to clip three. We've got election fraud, insurance fraud, witness tamper, bank fraud. Tax fraud, financial disclosure. These are all potential crimes that Michael Cohen implicated Trump in. Trump is running a criminal enterprise out of the White House. So Republicans spent much of Wednesday oversight committee hearing wishing they were talking about something more useful like Hillary Clinton's emails. House Republicans spent the past few years when they were the majority party eschewing oversight of Donald Trump and his administration and instead holding hearings into such topics as social media and campus censorship of Trump supporters. Now that Democrats are in the majority and holding hearings that describe the potential legal jeopardy facing Donald Trump, House Republicans are suddenly very upset about wasting time and wasting taxpayer dollars. They they had 33 hearings on Benghazi, okay? And I remember one of the last ones they had, Tamron Hall was still on MSNBC. Kevin McCarthy was, uh, no, it was it was um, Trey Gowdy. Trey Gowdy from South Carolina who, who retired. Trey Gowdy was interviewed by Tamron Hall and she was asking him, okay, so what did you find out in this latest hearing? He didn't want to tell her what they found. He said, we made it public and the American people can go print this up. Okay? It, when they printed it up, it's something like 700 pages. And he said, well, we don't want to We don't want to reveal what it is. They can print it up. They can come to their decision. They come to the conclusion themselves. She said, you want the average American citizen to print up this document that's 700 pages and read it for themselves? She said, why can't you just tell me what, what you all found? Okay, this is the type of shenanigans that they were going through. Okay, how much time we have before we come back? 55, oh, yeah, 54 seconds. All right, 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. How's everybody doing? 313-778-7600. All right, and then also we'll talk about this story out of Florida dealing with the uh, teacher who put up the Colin Kaepernick display for African American History Month. Um, we also have one in Massachusetts. Uh, we'll deal with that also. We'll talk about Stefan Clark and Terrence Crutcher. Okay. This is not a caller. Yeah, I see. Okay, thanks. Um, the other thing is Trump's team had over 100 contacts with Russian right, linked five, officials. Four, three, two. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, March 3rd, 2019. And we are live. We're in our second hour. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, so right before the break, we were talking about the Michael Cohen hearings that took place uh, this past week. There were three. The one on Wednesday, February 27th, that was public. The one on Tuesday and Thursday was private behind closed doors for uh, uh, different house committees, House of Representative committees, okay? So we talked about this in the first hour, and Michael Cohen testified in front of Congress and implicated Trump in at least 11 
different felonies. Now, read the article from Vice.com, uh, news.vice.com, V-I-C-E. Michael Cohen implicated Trump in at least 11 different felonies. This is from March 1st, 2019. We were going over this right before the break. I think we're up to felony number four. Also, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show that helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, pay the bills. Um, also, uh, or you can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well, okay? All my DVD lectures are there. We have digital downloads and uh, the online courses that I teach that are on demand as well, okay? AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, so if you're just tuning in, um, felony number one, potential evidence in a Russia conspiracy. Uh, number two, lying to Mueller. Number three, suburning perjury. Number four, campaign campaign finance violation. Campaign finance violations. Now, I was the one who broke the Stormy Daniels story here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. I was um, a guest on uh, Cliff Russell's show back when Cliff Russell was alive. And uh, during the break, you know, I'm checking my time my timeline on Facebook. And I see the story pop up from rawstory.com about Stormy Daniels, you know, alleging an affair with Donald Trump and being paid hush money. I say, Cliff, look at this, right? So when we come back from the break, I talk about it and broke the story here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. And when I was first reading about it, I said, this sounds like a campaign finance law violation. Now, some people were saying, oh, no, this is just about sex and paying for sex, and, you know, cut paying to keep it quiet. I said, wait a second. With that, with it being that close to an election, if they did not report this, this this payment, they did not report this payment in connection with the election, that's a campaign finance law violation. That's a felony. Okay? So, campaign finance violations. Michael Cohen said his former boss directed him to organize hush money payments during the campaign to women. That means more than one. Women who claimed that they had slept with Donald Trump. Don't know why they want to sleep with Donald Trump, but okay. This accusation is not new and has been backed up by prosecutors from the Southern District of New York, the SD, SDNY, which is a huge problem for Donald Trump. In the Southern District of New York, which wrote in a sentencing memo that Michael Cohen committed crimes, quote, in coordination, in coordination with and at the direction of, end quote, Donald Trump. This is what the SDNY wrote. Now, Michael Cohen added fresh evidence on Wednesday, February 27th, in the form of a check, in the form of a check signed by Trump that reimbursed Michael Cohen for the payout to adult film star Stormy Daniels, who has said she had a brief affair with Trump in 2006. She also said he was a two-minute brother, basically, if you go read what she said about him. <laughs> Many legal experts have already argued that Trump appears to be implicated in this one, including Lawrence Noble, former general counsel for the Federal Elections Commission, the FEC, who told the Washington Post, quote, there is little question Michael Cohen, the campaign, and the candidate are liable for the campaign finance violations. They call that's a felony. Next, we have election fraud. Michael Cohen said Trump knew exactly what he was giving Cohen money for to silence the women and keep voters from finding out about Trump's affairs. If so, then aside from the campaign finance violation, which is a felony, Donald Trump may have also entered into a conspiracy to defraud the U.S. by thwarting the administration of a fair election because he's hiding this information from the public. He's paying to keep this quiet because he does not want this to interfere with the election. That's another felony. Quote, that charge can apply any time a person conspires with others to frustrate or impede the lawful functions of a government agency, end quote, says Seth Waxman, W-A-X-M-A-N, a former prosecutor based in Washington, D.C., who wrote this in an email to Vice News. Quote, so if Trump's actions were designed to frustrate or impede the Federal Election Commission's FEC ability to disclose campaign expenditures, defined essentially as, quote, anything of value, end quote, to the American people, then yes, 
he could be charged with conspiracy to defraud the United States, end quote, said former prosecutor Seth Waxman. They're looking at election fraud, felony. Next, insurance fraud. Michael Cohen also alleged that Trump made false claims to insurance companies by inflating the size of his assets. Now, Trump lies about the size of his assets all the time, right? <laughs> Monetarily and others, okay? And then if you look, you know, I was doing research because I remember I put up this article from the Washington Post because I remember when Trump was running back in 2015, Trump filed his, um, his campaign campaign. Uh, financial papers and he estimated his net worth at 10 billion dollars and he was talking about how rich he was and all this stuff right 10 billion dollars but then um i think it was last year and I'm, I'm looking for the article now i think it was last year he estimated his assets at 1.4 billion or 1.5 billion i'm like wait a second what happened to the rest of the money? What, what, what are the other assets? And what people have alleged, and, and um, David K. Johnson, who you'll see frequently on MSNBC, he wrote a book about Donald Trump. He's an expert on taxes, things like this. He's talked about before how Trump will just inflate his assets at will. He'll just pull stuff out the air. OK, but when you do that on an insurance form, when you do that to get a bank loan, that's called fraud. That's a felony. <laughs> I mean, come on. All right. So look at this article from Washington Post. OK, I'm pulling up right now. Um, Trump retains assets worth at least one point four billion. OK, Trump retains assets worth at least one point four billion. New disclosure shows Now this is from June 16th, 2017. This is after the election. During the election, he said he's worth 10 billion. OK, now, let, let's look at let's look at this article very quickly. See, this backs up what I was talking about. All right. Now, this is from June 16th, 2017. Donald Trump reported on a new financial disclosure that his far flung real estate and hotel assets are worth at least $1.4 billion, a stark illustration of the complex financial interest he has maintained in the White House. The report, which the president voluntarily filed with the Office of Government Ethics, shows that he collected an influx of new revenue from recent foreign deals and a surge of business at his signature Mar-a-Lago property in Florida. Trump has made his wealth a key element of his political brand, and his refusal to relinquish ownership of his company has spurred ethics complaints and legal challenges. As a candidate, Donald Trump claimed he was worth more than $10 billion, although his net worth is impossible to determine from his financial disclosures, and he has not provided independent evidence to back that up. The White House did not make any statements about his net worth when his filing was posted Friday by the Ethics Office. This is going back to June of 2017. The report does not require officials to report their exact income, tax rate, or charitable uh, giving, unlike a tax return, which the president has refused to release, breaking with past tradition. Trump's 98-page disclosure shows he held on to the vast majority of his assets since his last disclosure in May of 2016, where he reported his holdings were worth at least $1.5 billion. However, he did sell dozens of stocks. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Read, check out the rest of this. Now, the other thing is that uh, Michael Cohen implied that Trump is not under an audit. Which I said before, Trump is not under an audit because all he had to do was to produce the audit notification letter that the IRS sends you to let you know you're going to be audited. He Not only has he not produced it, he hasn't even volunteered to produce it to prove that he's under audit. Trump's not under audit. He's just lying to people. He's just kind to people. 
because he doesn't want to provide his tax returns because that'll cause people to start doing too much investigating and find out he's a fraud, find out who he owes money to, find out he's not the big successful businessman that he's been lying claiming to be. He's not under an audit, but he should be. He's not under an audit right now. He wasn't under an audit when he ran for president, but he probably should be. So we have election fraud. We have insurance fraud. Michael Korn also alleged that Trump made false claims to insurance companies by inflating the size of his assets, a move that Michael Korn said would have allowed him to reduce his premiums. Quote, to your knowledge, did the president ever provide inflated assets to an insurance company? End quote. As Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She kicked butt. She did an excellent job when she asked her questions. I watched the whole thing. I watched all it was about seven hours, even during the one hour recess. I watched the whole thing. She did an excellent job. OK, Democrat from New York. Michael Cohen said, yes, quote, insurance fraud is submitting a written statement that contains materially false information or conceals information in order to get something of value. And that's exactly and that's exactly what Michael Cohen is alleging happened here, said Duncan Levin, a former federal prosecutor who specializes in financial crime. Quote, what he's laying out is the basis of a bread and butter criminal case, the kind that's prosecuted every single day in state courts and federal courts, end quote. Former federal prosecutor Duncan Levin said. Next, we have witness tampering. Michael Cohen and Democrats in Congress have accused Donald Trump of attempting to intimidate him out of testifying against Trump by making threats against Michael Cohen's family. Those are mob tactics. Trump has said that Michael Cohen's father-in-law ought to be investigated and accused Michael Cohen of making up things about Trump in an attempt to shield his own family. In response to top House Democrats, in response, top House Democrats issued a quote unquote warning to Donald Trump saying that our nation's laws prohibit efforts to discourage, intimidate, or otherwise pressure a witness not to provide testimony to Congress. End quote. Now Trump has denied threatening Michael Cohen, saying, quote, he's only been threatened by the truth, end quote. Donald Trump wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him upside his head. This is the same guy mm -hmm. that told over 8,600 false and misleading statements. Since he took the oath of office January 20, 2017, he wouldn't, know the, he wouldn't know the truth if it came and slapped him upside the head. Bank fraud. Michael Cohen said Donald Trump inflated his wealth while seeking to borrow money from Deutsche Bank. Don't pay attention to Deutsche Bank because we got a clip coming up from Maxine Waters. Deutsche Bank is cooperating with the House Finance Committee. This is not good for Trump. Michael Cohen said Donald Trump inflated his wealth while seeking to borrow money from Deutsche Bank in a failed attempt to buy the Buffalo Bills in 2014. See, Donald Trump has always wanted to own an NFL team. And the owners did not approve him. They knew he was a con man, a fraud. Uh, back during the 80s, he wanted to buy an NFL team. He was blocked. So that's when he bought the New Jersey Generals. Then there's a documentary that's on Netflix about the USFL. And this, I forgot the exact name, but this documentary deals with how they, they basically blame Donald Trump for the USFL folding. Because when Trump was blocked from buying an NFL team back in the 80s, he, he, bought, the U, he bought the New Jersey Generals in a uh, USFL team. They last, the, the USFL, United States Football League, lasted three seasons. At first, they were not in direct competition with the NFL. The USFL played their games like in the offseason from the NFL, so they were not in, in like direct competition. But... It was the last season, I think it was. Trump convinced the owners to change the schedule of their games to be in, in direct competition with the NFL because Trump was bitter because he was blocked from buying an NFL team. Okay? So then that didn't work for the USFL. They end up going bankrupt. They end up filing a lawsuit against the NFL. They... Um, the, the, it, it, so they filed a lawsuit against the NFL claiming um, the NFL had a monopoly, if I remember correctly. The, the, the court ruled in the USFL's favor, but they were paid something like $3 in damages. They, it, the USFL went bankrupt. 
largely because of Donald Trump. Go watch that documentary, Google. I forgot the exact name of it, but it deals with the USFL. And it deals with Donald Trump's involvement in the USFL. And it talks about how Donald Trump basically led to the downfall of the USFL by, by convincing the owners to change the schedule from the offseason to the play the games during the NFL season to compete directly with the NFL. So we have bank fraud. Michael Cohen said Trump inflated his wealth while seeking to borrow money from Deutsche Bank and a failed attempt to buy the Buffalo Bills in 2014. Now remember, Deutsche Bank is basically the only, only bank that's going to allow, that, that, that will loan Trump money. He couldn't get money from U.S. banks because he had a habit of not paying back his loans. Okay? And remember, Deutsche Bank was fined a few years ago $600 million for laundering $10 billion in money from Russia. This is Deutsche Bank, D-E-U-T-S-C-H-E. Uh, -E. Deutsche Bank, research Deutsche Bank, Google Deutsche Bank. Now, lying to, to a financial institution to get a loan would be bank fraud, which carries a maximum 30-year sentence. Last time I checked, that's called a felony. Now, Michael Cohen said Donald Trump almost doubled the size of his fortune by adding $4 billion in brand value, which essentially would mean that Trump's ability to slap his name on stuff is worth $4 billion. Trump just pulls his, his net worth just out the air. He just inflates it and deflates it to his benefit. Now, Michael Cohen provided documents suggesting this creative claim allowed Donald Trump to pump up, pump up his net worth from $4.6 billion in 2012 to $8.7 billion a year later. Okay? This is what I'm saying. When, when Trump filed his campaign finance form in 2000, I think it was 2015 when he was running for president, he said his net worth was $10 billion. Okay? But then, if you look over the course of time, then in 2017, he deflated his net worth. What, what, where, did the, where did the billions of dollars go? What happened? So, Michael Korn provided documents suggesting this creative claim allowed Trump to pump up his net worth from $4.6 billion in 2012 to $8.7 billion a year later. Trump's attempt to buy the Buffalo Bills did not succeed, succeed, and the loan was never made. Quote, on his face, this certainly sounds like the contours of a bank fraud charge, end quote, said um, former prosecutor Levin, Duncan Levin. The devil's in the details, and there would have to be a lot of follow-up questions, but he's certainly laying out the basis for further investigation, end quote. Next, felony is tax fraud. Michael Korn also uh, said Trump, quote, deflated his assets to reduce his real estate taxes, end quote. That's a felony. Alex Alexandria, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez asked Michael Korn about a 2016 Washington Post article which noted that Trump's financial disclosure forms valued his national golf club, Jupiter, in Florida at more than $50 million. Even though his attorneys had gone to court the previous year to argue that for tax purposes, the property was worth no more than $5 million. So here he's trying to argue it's worth $50 million. And over here, for tax purposes, he's trying to argue the same property is worth only $5 million, no more than $5 million. Explaining how the practice generally went down, Michael Cohen said, quote, you deflate the value of the asset and then you put in a request to the tax department for a deduction. You deflate the value of the asset and then you put in a request to the tax department for a deduction. Okay, we're up against a break. We're up against a break. All right, we got to go to break. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. When we come back, I'm going to uh, play the clip from uh, Reverend Al Sharpton. He was interviewed about Lamp Patton being used as a prop of Representative Mark Meadows. We'll deal with that. Then we'll get into the story dealing with uh, Stefan Clark and Terrence Crutcher. 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation Future Radio, Michael M. Hotel. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. We'll go to the phone lines when we come back. Okay. I got a Reverend Al Sharpton, the darkest thing I've seen in Trump Tower. Yeah, is that clip three? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. Yeah. We're, we're going to go to that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. No, that's fine. We'll go to that. Man, this is deep. Michael Cohen implicated Trump in at least 11 felonies. I just want to know how long it's going to take for him to get out that office. I mean, obviously... He'll probably be forced to resign. He'll probably be forced to resign before impeachment, before he's put on trial in the U.S. House of Representatives. Probably, to, he, I think he'll be forced to resign this year, 2019. Oh, I really this think year. It, so I, I, I think they're not going to wait till next year? I think, I think it'll be forced. It's going to get hot. It's going to get really hot. And what I think is going to happen, he's going to end up being forced to resign. He's going to, he's going to trade resigning for them not to prosecute his children. That is, that's probably what would happen. Yeah, taking the easy way out like always. Now he may be now he may be he may get hit with charges from state attorney generals like the state of New York, things like this, but he may he may trade he's gonna be forced to resign from office, just like Richard Nixon was forced to resign from office. Yeah. He's gonna be forced to resign from office. All right, guys, stand by. We'll be back from break in, in uh, like one minute. Yeah, we're about to have like 20 seconds. Okay, we're back in 20 seconds? Yeah. All right, good. And then we'll, we'll go to the phone lines also. Okay. I'm going to go to Leroy first. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Stand by. Five, four, three, <coughs> two. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It's Sunday, March 3rd, 2019. Hey, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, email me, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, or call me 313 462 313-462-0003. Um, also visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com all of my DVD lectures are there including the ones dealing with the film Black Panther we saw Black Panther won big at the Oscars uh, last Sunday uh, Ruth Carter won for costume design and then also uh, Hannah Belcher won for set design as well two African American women um, they uh, made history uh, last, uh, last Sunday and that was also the first superhero movie to win an Oscar as well. First Marvel, uh, I think it's the first superhero movie, period, to win an Oscar also. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to Leroy, line one. Hey, Leroy, thanks for holding. Welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. Le okay, Leroy, are you there? Okay, I only, I only hear Leroy. Maybe he's hung up. Leroy, are you there? Okay, let's go to line two. Let's go to uh, Rob from Cali. Hey, Rob, uh, uh, thanks for holding. Uh, uh, welcome to the African History Network show. Go ahead with your question or comment. Hello, I've got a uh, comment. Thank you for uh, 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 two questions. But one comment, thank you for talking about um, the Storm of Daniel thing because when I was watching Fox News, the people should be to judge. I think his name is Nep, 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 Napolitano, Judge Napolitano. Yeah, 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 when, when Cohen was found guilty, I think, in New York, mm -hmm. uh, 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 he, he, he even said that when, when it first happened, he said that, that Donald Trump is guilty of a felony. Mm -hmm. so you know, of course he went. But, uh, but I got two questions for you. Go ahead. Um, one, everybody's talking about reparations mm -hmm. right now. Um, and, 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 and I thought that yesterday was the world reparations. But how... The thing is, how how do we orchestrate it? Like, like because Thank it's very hard because time. I don't know if I trust the uh -huh. some, some community lead, uh, uh, excuse me, some um, black politicians to distribute. Do we trust black banks to distribute? Um, it, it, it 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 it'll come from the federal government. It'll come from the federal government. It wouldn't come from a politician. If you're talking about reparations, okay. Um, if we look at um, so the, 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 the whole argument over reparations is tricky because a lot of people make an argument don't understand history. I'll be doing, I'll be doing a broadcast probably sometime this week dealing with uh, reparations, Democrats, and the $14 trillion hoax. And, and the reason why is is because reparations is owed to African Americans, but is different 
than what many people think. So you have a lot of people, you know, people have done the research and said, well, the U.S. government owes us $14 trillion for our ancestors working for 246 years for free as enslaved Africans, right? That's the argument being made. So my question to them would be, when you study the history of slavery in this country, where did you read that slaves were supposed to be paid? This is the whole problem. This is the whole problem with this argument. We, we're making a moral argument and not a legal argument. It was legal to enslave Africans and not pay them. So if it's legal to enslave them and not pay them, how did you come 154 years after chattel slavery ends trying to sue for back wages? The whole purpose of enslaving them was not to pay them. It was legal to do that. So there, there are two legal arguments to make for reparations, but that is not one of them. And the problem that's taking place is a lot of people who are putting forth a lot of people who are putting forth this message don't understand history, don't understand law, and they're preying on the emotions of our people. And it's a whole lot of wasted time and effort. Okay? Yes. So, so go ahead. Yeah, because Chad does not have to get like past the Congress. Yes. Yes, this is what people are not saying. Anybody, anybody that tries to tell you that the president can do an executive order to pay $14 trillion in reparations, number one, is lying to you. Number two, they don't understand Article One of the U.S. Constitution because Article One gives the power of the purse strings to Congress. That has to pass Congress. That's not, a, that's not an executive order. Anybody that's running around telling you the president can do an executive order to pay $14 trillion in reparations is a damn lie. And see, once again, they're preying on the ignorance of our people, and they're preying on the emotions of our people. First, if you do, you know how much the, you know how much the annual federal budget is, Rob. Oh yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. do, do you know how much the annual federal budget is? No, no. It's about four point three trillion dollars. Do you realize fourteen trillion dollars is more than three times the annual federal budget? So, so, the, so the whole argument people are making, there are two legitimate legal arguments for reparations. The $14 trillion is not one of them. And, what, and what's happening is too many people are putting this nonsense out here and don't understand history and don't understand law, and they're misleading our people. Now, some of them mean well and have good hearts. They just don't know any better. Others know better, and they're lying to our people. Go ahead. And I have to get this next call. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I don't have an evaluation. It's about it's about Bernie Sanders just jumped in. It's about ten or eleven in the Democrats. I don't have an evaluation right now. Most important thing African Americans should be focusing on is a comprehensive African American agenda. It, to present to all the candidates, including the Republicans. The most important thing so I, I I've seen interviews with them and things like this. Okay, but I haven't I haven't done an analysis of all of them because some of them you know, don't really have name recognition. Governor, governor, uh, uh, the governor from Washington just announced yesterday, I think it was, okay, Republic, uh, Democratic governor from Washington, the state of Washington, just announced, Inlay, Governor Inlay, just announced yesterday. So I don't know, but the most important thing at this point is not over this, this candidate over this candidate. Most important thing African Americans should be working on right now is a comprehensive African American agenda. To present to all the candidates, including the Republicans, not just the Democrats. Okay, go ahead. Hey, 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 Rob, you on the speakerphone? You on the speakerphone? Oh no. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Your voice is a little muffled. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that goes back to the reparations thing because I try to tell people, you know. You, you, you know, because because I know last or uh, a couple of years ago we had like Black Lives Matter, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it interrupting people in that big campaign, which which I, I understand why, but the thing is that 
you know, just like in the, in the I, I want to say in the 50s and 50s, you get back to, um, they feel a random, you know, desegregate the, um, the, the war factors after World War II, right? Yeah, that's Executive, so, Executive Order 8802, June 25th, 1941, that President Roosevelt signed. Yeah, 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 it's like, it, it, it's, it's like, okay, I understand people want to work, uh, people, it, it's, it's like, like you said, we need to put an agenda to the politicians before before we, um, like you said, we can't have agenda to a politician because you can't just write somebody off and say, you know, this is, you, you know, okay, no, we, you know, Martin Luther King and them, they met with Kennedy, you know, they met. Right, right. Um, we, you, you, your, your agenda, your agenda deals with your issues and deals with putting policies in place to address your issues but you have to understand history first and politics second and law to understand the policies that need to be put in place to address your issues okay and this this is where the research comes into place and a lot of people would rather do youtube videos than actually do the research so they know what the hell they're talking about when they do the youtube videos all right i gotta get this other call rob thanks for calling okay keep listening let's go to jerome line three jerome thanks for holding welcome to the african history network show tell us where you're calling from yeah, thanks for taking my call. I'm calling from Detroit. Okay, thanks. I'm trying to understand about these Republicans, how they cover up uh, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, 45, you know, yeah, uh, 45 crime boss. Yep. <laughs> Criminal know. enterprise, man. <laughs> Criminal enterprise. Boss. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, it's amazing to me how the Republicans cover up for him and the Democrats is 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 going way out the way to tell the public that he is he is wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, why doesn't the public march on Washington like in Venezuela? They a hey, gather up and they march on Venezuela because they're going through this presidential thing and. Why doesn't everybody just gather up? There have been a number of marches on Washington. Get him up out of here. Well, well just, 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 no, this man is no good. But just marching on Washington is not going to get Trump out of here. There have been a number of marches on Washington since Trump has been in office. There have been the Women's March. There have been the, march, there have yeah. been the marches uh, yeah. dealing with yeah. uh, gun violence from the youth. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So th there have been a yeah. number of marches since he's been in office. The most important okay. march is marching to the voting polls, right? And, oh, yeah. and, and, and voting these people, yeah. voting these Republicans out of office who are protecting Trump. You got, you yeah. got, you, you, you got the 2020 elections coming out. So people went to the polls in midterm elections. That's, and, why, and, 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 the, uh, that's why you got the hearings. Yeah. Because Democrats yeah. took back control of the House of Representatives, okay? Now, yeah. we, now, we, now we have to do it again in 2020. Because 2020, you have control of the U.S. Senate. That's up, okay? That's up for vote as well. Control, the U.S. Senate is crucial. Because the U.S. because the president not only nominates Supreme Court uh, justices, and that's approved by the U.S. Senate, but also the federal court judges. And Trump has done almost 200 nominations to the federal bench. Okay, right. see, people are not talking about that as much as the U.S. Supreme Court, and Trump is changing the landscape of the federal the bench. World. And that's a no, the federal bench. He, the federal bench. He's changing the landscape of the federal bench, and that's a lifetime appointment. That's a lifetime appointment, just like the U.S. Supreme Court is a lifetime appointment. Okay, mm -hmm. but the, but the, but the, but 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 the, but the U.S. Senate also confirms the 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 um, the. Um, the department, the the director of the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, uh, the EPA administrator, the HUD administrator, Department of Education, Secretary of Education, like Betsy DeVos, that all goes through the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate That's is extremely so important. Slow. Yeah, you know, it, all all be, all about us vote. Uh, yeah, House. absolutely. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. And then and then so in 2020, the House of Representatives is up for reelection because that's only a two year term. But you have a number of U.S. Senate seats that are up also. So it's not just it's not just about president it's about Congress. And unfortunately, what happens is a lot of Republicans understand that better than a lot of us. See, a lot of us would just focus on uh, uh, president, but don't understand the role that Congress plays. It's the House of Representatives that approves the president's budget. That four hundred, that 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 four point three trillion dollar budget, that's approved by the House of Representatives. 
See, 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 so many of us don't understand the role that Congress plays. Congress is a, a co-equal branch of government. Okay? Yeah, yeah, but, but like, uh, do you see how prejudiced the Senate is towards, towards what's going on? The, how prejudiced the, the what is? is? The Senate is prejudiced. Oh, absolutely. The, the Senate is, is on Trump's side. And oh, absolutely. Like, that, that is incredible. What, what, because, because Republicans work to maintain a majority in the U.S. Senate. You you only had, I think it was maybe 23 U.S. Senate seats and maybe 16 to 23 U.S. Senate seats that were up in right. November 2018, okay? Right. And they, and they right. worked tooth and nail to maintain control of the U.S. Senate so they can keep pushing Trump's agenda when it comes to confirming Supreme Court justices, which determines uh, federal law for the next 30 to 40 years, and confirming... Um, uh, federal judges as well. This is this is the whole purpose. This is uh, Senator Mitch McConnell's whole purpose in life to confirm conservative no to confirm conservative uh, judges to the federal bench. This is his whole purpose. Yeah, yeah. He's a white supremacist, but but see see there's a difference between being a white supremacist and being a focused white supremacist. He's focusing on law. He ain't just a white supremacist running around with a Confederate battle flag. He is one who is who the the the, the he he's the Senate Majority Leader. The Senate Majority Leader of the U.S. Senate okay. de determines which bills come to the Senate floor for them to vote on. That's him that can that that's him that determines that. So he ain't just your average white supremacist. He's a white supremacist with power to determine which bills get voted on and which bills don't get voted on. Okay. Well, 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 you know what? All I got to say is, my last saying is, Trump is an embarrassment to the whole world. Mm -hmm. He is an embarrassment to the United States. That's all I got to say. All right. Thanks for taking my call. All right, Jerome, keep listening. All right. All right. I want to go to this clip here because we're running out of time. See, I have, a, a, you know, I've compiled so much information here that it exceeds. I got like six, eight, six to eight hours worth of information for a two-hour show. That's just how I roll. You know, that's how I do. Okay, so I want to go to this clip here. This is from February 28th. This is from uh, Thursday, February 28th. Reverend Al Sharpton, uh, the darkest thing I have seen in the Trump Towers is the lighting in the elevator. Let's go to this clip. Okay, we'll go to that in just a second. So mm -hmm. this was uh, he, it Representative Brenda Lawrence of Detroit, my congresswoman, 14th Congressional District, and Reverend Al Sharpton, who you hear every Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Keeping It Real, right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation. Let's go to this clip. Demeaning comments about the, the president that Ms. Patton doesn't agree with. In fact, it has to do with your claim of racism. She says that as a daughter of a man born in Birmingham, Alabama, that there is no way that she would work for uh, for a, an individual who was racist. That moment sparking quick backlash online and in the hearing room when Republican Congressman Mark Meadows brought out HUD official and former Trump Organization employee Lynn Patton to refute Michael Cohen's claim that the president is racist. To prop up one member of our entire race of black people and say that that nullifies that is totally insulting. The fact that someone would actually use a prop, a black woman, in this chamber, in this committee, is alone racist in itself. Donald Trump is setting Mr. the Chairman, I ask that her Donald words be Trump taken down. It's racist to suggest that I ask her to come in here for that reason. Emotions certainly running high there. Joining me now is Democratic Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, who was in the hearing, as you just saw yesterday, and in that clip that we played, and Reverend Al Sharpton, host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network. Thanks to both of you for being here. I really appreciate it. I want to start with what we're hearing from Lynn Patton this morning. She wanted to speak out. She wanted to give her own perspective on what happened yesterday. Let's take a listen. I'll get your reaction on the other side. 
Are you a prop? prop? Are you a token? <laughs> you know, what I'd like yes. to ask the congresswoman from Michigan is, you know, why does she take the word of a self-confessed perjurer and criminally convicted white man over a black female? To me, that would be my question. That's more racist. Congresswoman Lawrence, let me start with you and just have you react to what you heard from Ms. Patton today. What I stated, the insult of bringing in a human prop, which we have never done in a congressional hearing, mm. and to take one person out of our entire race as if validating her and elevating her voice as a black person where her father was born, to me was insulting. You can say, any member can say, I don't believe the president is a racist, but don't insult me by saying that I can stop the conversation, I can validate whether a person is racist or not because you use one person to stand up who is employed, not at a high level, but employed by that administration is insulting. We were there to question about 10 years of what happened in the Trump administration. And that witness said the, the, the president was racist and he used words that we have heard him say publicly all in his tweets and his, mm. in his speeches. And so please don't, don't insult me. Reverend Al, what did you make of what you heard from Ms. Patton today? She says she's not a prop, and yet you hear the point Congresswoman Lawrence made yesterday in that testimony, and she's making it again right here today. Well, first of all, to be in the room where you know you are not going to be sworn in, you can't speak, you can't even get to a microphone, you're nothing but a prop. I mean, for her to say to Congresswoman Talib or Lawrence, do you take the word of someone over my word? What word? She couldn't testify. She was standing there as a prop that was not allowed to speak, was not brought there to speak. I wish she would step forward and let some uh, of the Congress people question her. Because I would ask her, have you ever seen black executives in the Trump Organization? I, I have Christian for over 30 years, gone back and forth with meetings with Donald Trump, fighting with him over issues, standing up to him. I've been in Trump Towers uh, 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 any number of times. I've never seen one black executive in the C-suite, in the C-suite. Michael Cohen was there. He was the one that would set up the meetings. He was the one that would try to talk to us. Mm -hmm. Lynn Patton ought to be challenged why we've never seen a top executive in the Trump organization if you're so convinced he's not racist. Right, and right, the right man now. that was in the room with him is saying these are the things he said and felt. Let me follow up with you on that point, because I know that you have had private meetings with President Trump when he was a citizen, a candidate, about the issue of race. That's what right. has your message been to him in those meetings? Did he hear you? I know it. Not at all. In fact, that's why Michael Cohen would try to set up meetings. When I was attacking him about birtherism being racist, he would argue, I'm not a racist, but what you're saying is racist. Let's not make it personal, Mr. Trump. About the Central Park Five, we marched on him. Yes. And all of these trips, all of these meetings, I said this morning and I repeat, the darkest thing I ever saw in Trump Towers was the tinted lighting in the elevators. I've never seen a black executive on the floor with Donald Trump. I, 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 want, I want to add something. I was asked by a white male, I don't want to be called a racist. I said, well, don't do racist <laughs> things. When you call people names, when you insult people, and the majority of them are people of color, when you use comments that you are told are hateful and it hurt people and you choose to keep saying those things, then your racist behavior becomes your identity. And everybody has a moment to learn. And yesterday, if anything else, I hope we learn that the way that that point was being made by our, my colleague was not appropriate. And I hope that was a learning lesson. And at the end of all of the sort of heated comments that we heard surrounding this yesterday, it ended on what I thought was a pretty remarkable moment. I want to have you both respond, but let's watch that moment first. And Mr. Chairman, you are, 
You and I have a personal relationship that's not based on color. And and to even go down this direction is, is wrong, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Meadows, you know, uh, and of all the people on this committee, uh, I've said it and got in trouble for it, that you're one of my best friends. I know that shocks a lot of people. And, <laughs> and likewise, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. But you are. And I would do, and I could see and feel your pain. I feel it. Congresswoman Lawrence, your emotions as you watch that, both of them were getting emotional. To me, it underscored how complicated this issue is for two people who do truly care about each other. The issue, and I will repeat it again, the way that that was presented was inappropriate, and some will say it was a racist act. We need to learn from it and move on. I have worked and talked with Mr. Meadows. I have a lot of, I, you know, he and I are people who can sit in the room and disagree and have respect for each other. Mm. But I need to tell him, and I need to speak up. When something is wrong, it's inappropriate. And this, hopefully, is a learning lesson for all of us. Well, this is a conversation that could continue for the rest of the hour, but so appreciate your insights, your perspective, your thoughts on what happened yesterday. Congressman Brenda Lawrence, Reverend Al Sharpton, thanks to both of you. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let's pause it there. Okay, so that was from um, MSNBC. That was, um, it was, uh, I forgot the lady's name sitting there for Hallie Jackson. Uh, you can watch that clip msnbc.com rev al sharpton the darkest thing i have seen in the trump towers is the lighting in the elevator that's from february 28 2019 now when representative mark meadows republican from north carolina when he spoke out against representative uh, rashida Tlaib from detroit okay and he took offense to her now she wasn't calling him a racist Okay. Now, people have to understand, it, and, and um, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, who used to work in the U.S. Senate, who hosts the last word on MSNBC, he talked about this. I'm running out of time, so I don't have time to get to that clip. But watch this clip. Uh, it's called Racism in the Coin Hearing. Racism in the Coin Hearing from February 28, 2019, from the last word. It's at MSNBC.com. Because uh, Lawrence O'Donnell explained the House, the House of Representative rules do not allow House members of the House to insult other members of the House of Representatives. Okay, and insist that and insist that does not mean Mark Meadows is not racist. Okay, so uh, this is why Representative Rashida Tlaib cannot call him a racist. That violates the House rules. Personally, I would have said I'm not calling Representative Meadows a racist. I'm simply saying Representative Meadows is defending a white supremacist and a racist and a bigot named Donald John Trump. Okay, that's what I would have said. Now, Representative Meadows took offense at it. He took offense at uh, Representative Rashida Tlaib because a hit dog will holler. And that's what he was doing. He was a hit dog. He is a white supremacist. Because after that, then video of him going back to, I think it was 2012, surfaced of him uh, uh, telling, uh, uh, talking about President Obama and saying we're going to send him back to Kenya or wherever it is he's from. Because Representative Mark Meadows was a birther. Okay? He was one of the ones talking about uh, President Obama wasn't born in this country. Representative Meadows is a white supremacist. Now, News1.com has an article called Mark Meadows Showed Us the Six Stages White Men Go Through When Getting Called Out for Racism. Read this article from News1.com, March 1st, 2019, written by David Dennis Jr. Mark Meadows showed us the six stages white men go through when getting called out for racism. They generally follow a pretty strict blueprint that's become achingly familiar. OK, so what happens is you have the racist act. OK, the white man's response to being called racist begins, of course, with the racist act uh, or white supremacist bigger than that. This act is rarely the Hollywood racist moment. Um, uh, the, uh, OK, so then you have two shock and outrage. OK, how dare you usually comes next. OK, then number three, I know a black person. I have a black friend. I had a black maid. I had a black teacher. You know, they try to show proximity to African-Americans, all right? I have a black friend. I can't be racist. I had a black girlfriend. You know, I got I got a lap dance from a black stripper one time, right? Number four, no, no, you're a racist. Then they try to flip it and say, no, you're, no, you're the one that's racist, okay? Number five is 
the revelation that the person so outraged at being called a racist, though he was never called a racist, has more evidence than he is, in fact, a racist. A hit dog will holler. This goes back to uh, Andrew Gillum in Florida, the gubernatorial, the gubernatorial uh, debate. And he said, I'm not saying Mr. DeSantis is a racist. I'm simply saying the racists believe Mr. DeSantis is a racist. Okay? And then number six, a shrug. And like a whimper, like nothing happened, because what really, uh, uh, what really ever happens to white men who reveal themselves to be racist? They do all that crime because the racist word to white men is like the N-word. Why? Because white men will never have to face something as deadly, painful, and, and as hateful as the N-word. Okay, so check this out. I don't have time to get through all of it. News1.com. Mark Meadows showed us the six stages white men go through when getting called out for racism. All right, uh, let's go to... Um, a, a little bit of this clip here. Stefan Clark and uh, Terrence Crutcher, okay? Stefan Clark, the, the police, the two police officers who shot and killed Stefan Clark in his grandmother's backyard uh, uh, are not going to be charged, okay? Uh, we, have, um, we have the clip from um, uh, Politics Nation. Uh, it's clip number, let's see, I think it's clip number six or seven. Oh, okay. Politics Nation. Let's go to let's go to that. I'm gonna squeeze that in here. Yeah, clip number six from Politics Nation. Okay. Uh, so New York Times was reporting no charges in Sacramento police shooting of Stefan Clark. Let me know when you have it ready. Two Sacramento police officers who shot and killed an unarmed black man in his grandmother's backyard last year, 2018, will not face criminal prosecution. Okay. The Sacramento County District Attorney. Yeah, get past the commercial. The Sacramento County uh, District Attorney uh, announced on Saturday. Okay, March 2nd, stirring fresh outrage in a city roiled by protests over the killing. For nearly a year, community members and activists have demanded um, a police accountability for the death of Stefan Clark, age 22, who was killed uh, last year. Yeah, who was killed uh, uh, last March 2018 by officers Terrence uh, Mercado and Jared uh, Robink, uh, uh, R O B I N E T, I guess it is, Robinet. Okay, the officers have been dispatched to investigate a routine vandalism complaint. Within 10 minutes of their arrival, after a brief pursuit, um, Stefan Clark was dead. Okay, that's, that's the clip. We have it ready? Yep. Okay, let's go to this clip. And we follow our ethical responsibilities. We will not charge these officers with any criminal liability related to the shooting death and the use of force on Stefan Clark. Sacramento County District Attorney Ann Marie Shelbert announcing that the two police officers who shot and killed Stephon Clark last March have lawfully used lethal force. This just one day after the Justice Department decided not to pursue charges in a different case against a police officer in Oklahoma who shot and killed unarmed motorist Terrence Crutcher during a traffic stop. Two different cases. Two unarmed black Americans dead. Joining me now from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, the uh, twin sister of Terrence, and the family attorney, Demario Solomon Simmons. And here on set with me is civil rights attorney, Benjamin Crump, who's representing uh, both the Crutcher family and uh, works of, and is the attorney for the Clark family. Let me start with this, uh, with you, attorney Crump. I got the call from uh, the grandmother of Stephen Clark yesterday when this announcement was made and she couldn't join you today because she's now hospitalized. Yes, sir, and it's so unfortunate, Reverend Al, because in her backyard is where he was executed and when the DA rendered her, the verdict or her decision, it was overwhelming for Miss Sequita and uh, she had to be rushed to the hospital. So we're asking for everybody's prayers uh, for the family, especially Miss Sequita as she struggles with her. Absolutely. Let, let me say this. Uh, you and I have worked on several civil rights cases and we do not say people had to be convicted one way or another, but it should not die in the prosecutor's office. One of the reasons I'm so outraged about Sacramento they didn't even bring this to a grand jury. This was a decision made by the DA. Absolutely, and Reverend Al, we don't ask for due process and equal justice. We're not asking for anything special. And when you think about what this DA did in trying to justify uh, 
these officers killing Stefan, it was outrageous because not only did she use the old playbook where you assassinate the unarmed black man's character, like they did in Terrence Crutcher after you assassinate this person, but she took it to a whole new level, Reverend Al, suggesting this suicide by cop uh, theory that is so bogus. But if you believe her, then Stefan should have all eight bullets to the front. And we know that most of the bullets out of the eight shots came to his back. But she awesome. didn't talk about that. Okay, so uh, we got to get out of here. Hey, watch this full clip in its entirety at MSNBC.com. Rev Al Sharpton on the pursuit of justice. This was on Politics Nation, uh, March 3rd, 2019. Rev Rev Al Sharpton on the pursuit of justice. You watch that entire clip. It's, it's really powerful. They deal with Terrence Crutcher as well. Okay, look, we have to get out of here. We, uh, stay tuned for Pastor Mo. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can donate to the African History Network there as well. Uh, our DVD lectures are there also. Uh, email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next week. Peace.